right, I want to welcome everybody on our Panama City campus and our online campus. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, man, we're excited that you're here. My name is Roy. I'm one of the pastors, if we haven't already met. And uh, I'm teaching this message on the fear of failure because I'm good at it. Listen, um, I have quite the failure resume. I have failed fast and frequently. I don't know, can anybody relate to that? In fact, if you, ever, if you have ever failed at anything, would you raise your hand? Wow, we are just a bunch of failures. Good grief. And the person next to you that didn't raise their hand, they're not a failure, they're a liar. So uh, first 30 seconds of the message today, already called you a failure and a liar. It's going to be a great day. huh? All right, but here's something that I want us to understand, that, that there's something much worse than the fear of failure, and that's the pain of regret. And no one likes to fail, but some of the time um, we find ourselves afraid, right, to step out and to, to, to do the, some things that we really want to because we're afraid that we might fail. So today's message unpacks what God says about failure so that we can have the courage and the faith to, to step out into the unknown and let go of our regrets and replace that with faith because we all have to face failure. I remember when I graduated from, high, uh, from college, actually, I just wanted to go to the place and do the thing where I can make the biggest impact for Jesus in my world and my generation. And so at that point, I really believed that that was New York City. And so I went and uh, I worked at a church in Upper Manhattan, and about a year out and a half after I started, two of the major leaders in the church and the senior pastor called me into his office. They sat me down and they said, Roy, you know, we know that you love God. We know that you love people, but we just think like you need some more practical, real world experience. Like I had been operating in some, you know, Doctor Who alternate universe or something. And so they said that they didn't think that I should continue to work at the church in ministry for a while, that I should like go out into the secular world and, you know, get a job in, Man in somewhere in New York and, you know, get this real world experience. Now they said that they thought that I could probably go to another ministry and get another ministry job, but they, they didn't think that that was what was best for me and they cared for me. And that's why they were telling me this. Now, when I tell this story and my wife's with me, at the end of the story, she always looks at the person I'm talking to and says, he got fired, <laughs> which is exactly what happened. And I wonder, um, you know, I, I remember actually, I remember right after that experience uh, was the church's staff retreat. It was an annual retreat. It was my favorite thing of the year. And I can remember very vividly driving my roommate, who had not gotten fired, and dropping him off and sitting in my car and watching them leave me behind. And I can remember being absolutely devastated, just, just overwhelmed with this feeling and sense of failure and shame. And I wonder... If you've ever sat in the car with those kinds of feelings or sat in your couch or laid in bed just feeling the, the, the crushing weight of your own failures. And the question is, in those times, do you continue or do you just stop and run? And I remember sitting in the car with all these feelings just going in waves over me thinking about what my college friends would think. Because I was kind of a little bit of a big deal in ministry in my college. Like I had won some ministry awards that were prestigious. I knew they were prestigious because they not only came with a plaque, but with like a thousand dollar check. I had started uh, ministry teams that traveled internationally to the Philippines, Brazil, Africa. And uh, now I am facing my greatest fear, which is I failed at what I thought God called me to do. Should I stay and face the embarrassment and shame of volunteering in a church that just fired me? Because I, I did have some other options. There was this guy named Alistair Begg who uh, was a pastor of a church in Ohio. It was actually much bigger than the church I was in there in Manhattan. And he was kind of a little bit famous as kind of this radio preacher guy. And, um, you know, I could, he had offered me a job. And if I had taken that job, like to everybody on the outside, that would have looked like a step up. Right? That I was just moving forward and getting better. But I had to stay, 
I had, to, I, had to, I had to make a decision. Would I stay? What if, I couldn't get away with what if it was true? What if I, if I stayed, I would be a stronger person and a better leader? And I'd like you to know something that I wish I knew. It's our bottom line today. And in fact, I want you to go ahead and pull out your message notes if you haven't already and write it down. Because when you have to face a question like I had to face, and sadly, you are going to have to. You are going to have to face your failures. And here's the way you do it. Here's the bottom line. That you need to focus on what happens in you over what happens to you. See, today we're beginning this new series on fear. And the series is going to address the four biggest fears that people face. The fear of failure, rejection, intimacy, and the fear of losing control. And today we're going to discover through God's word how to overcome the fear of failure. So let's begin with actually our key verse for the entire study. It's in 1 Timothy 1 7 and i'd like us actually to read it together out loud in unison can we do that beginning with the word for ready for god has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity but of power love and self-discipline you know some of you you have a dream right Something that you want to do, something that makes your heart beat a little bit faster, and you, you, you want to take that next step. And maybe, like, you're already started, but like me, it's sort of crumbling in down on you, and you have to decide, are you going to keep going, or are you going to, like, pull away? Or maybe you haven't started yet. Maybe you're afraid to apply for that college that intimidates you, or maybe afraid to apply for that job that, that seems to be like, you know, you're not really good enough for or maybe to start that blog or write that book or because if you do right there's that little thing in the back of your head that's saying what if you're not good enough what if you don't measure up what if when you're done it's worse than when you started to try see you got to understand that fear does not come from god god wants to replace our fear with faith because god has not given us a spirit of fear and we have to be honest with ourselves. Why don't you jot this down? Everyone fears failure. We all do. If we talk about the fear of failure, we need to begin by understanding that giving in to the fear of failure is extremely costly. In fact, Jesus tells a parable, a story, uh, that illustrates the cost of giving in to the fear of failure. It's a story about this guy who owned a business and he went on a journey. And uh, before he went on this journey, he called three of these guys that worked for him in. And it says he gave five bags of silver to one. And uh, historians look at it, and um, it, it was called a talent also. They figure a bag of silver was worth about 15 years' wages. So if we translate that into kind of our median incomes here, it was about five bags would be about $3.5 million. Okay, so this is it's not chump change. Okay, this is a big deal. It says two bags of silver he gave to another. So that's about $1.4 million. And uh, then one bag of silver to the last. So that's about $700,000 or so. So the guy with $3.5 million, he invests it, he doubles it, gives the boss back about $7 million. The guy with one4 he puts it to work, he uses it to earn uh, another one4 so he gives the boss back almost $3 mil. But the last guy, it says then... The servant, oh, oh, well, um, he divided it into proportion right to their abilities, left on his trip. And then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, look, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and, and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid. Can we say those three words together? Ready? I was afraid. One more time. I was afraid. I wonder how many things we've never done or done that we shouldn't. Because we were afraid. He was afraid that, that he would lose his money. So he said, I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. There's almost this sense of, you should be proud of me, right? I still have what you gave me. And so what did the master say in reply? Did he say, hey, good job. You know, you played it safe. You didn't take any risks. Man, I did not lose anything when I gave you this. No, he, sa he said exactly the opposite. Look what he said. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. I want you to think about it. This guy didn't steal any of his master's money. He didn't cheat anybody. None of that. He just played it safe. He just let his fear, I was afraid, get the best of him. And he didn't step out and take a risk. And so look what happened. 
He said, then he, then he ordered, take the money away from this servant and give it to the one with the 10 bags of silver. The fear of failure paralyzed this guy. So he didn't take any risk, and he ended up losing what he had guarded. But that's not what God wants, because God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power. And I know some of you, right, deep inside, God, God has been storing in you a vision, maybe, maybe to start a business, but you're afraid. You're hesitating. Why? Because you're afraid, what if the financing doesn't come through? Well, what if it doesn't work out? So you hesitate. Some of you know that God is calling you to the biblical tithe to worship him through the first 10% of your earnings. In fact, some of you even took the tithe challenge about a month ago when I shared about that, but you haven't followed through because you're afraid. What if it doesn't work out at the end of the month? Some of you, you are passionate about a particular organization in our community that serves our community and you love what they do and you would love for our church to get involved with them and be a part of helping them accomplish what you're so passionate about and you 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 know what you you should walk out these doors or if you're online you should go to the chat room and when the service is over you should find pastor guy and say hey could we do something in our serve day in november to help this organization that i'm so passionate about but you're not going to do you know why because you're afraid. You're afraid that you're not ready to help lead something like that. How are you going to overcome this fear of failure that keeps you from living the exhilarating life of seeing God do his work through you in the way he designed you to live and act and accomplish? How are we going to do that? Jack Canfield once said, everything you want is on the other side of fear. How do you break through your fear? The other side, to get what you want, what God wants for you on the other side of your fear. I'm going to give you three truths from the Bible that will help you, that will help us to overcome our fears. And the first one, you need to write it down. Okay, This is one of those real feel-good statements. Ready? Write it down. You will fail. That's right. You are amazing. You are wonderful. You, you, you were gloriously designed by the master craftsman and architect of the universe, and sometime you suck. I suck. Like we all suck sometime, so let's get used to it. You probably think, well, that's kind of negative, Roy. I'm not sure the Bible says that. Well, don't believe me. In fact, you should never believe me. You should, you should always look and make sure what I say is what the Bible says. So let's look at what James, brother of Jesus, here's what he said. He said, indeed, we all make many mistakes. Why don't you look at the person next to you, point your bony finger at him and say, you make many mistakes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, somebody's a little too enthusiastic there. Now say, but I make many more. Go ahead. You have to accept the truth that unless you're Jesus or don't ever try anything, you are going to fail. Don't fear it. Embrace it because it is a part of you becoming the person that can succeed. Winston Churchill said this. He said, success is stumbling from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. Some of you, you were told by your coaches, or your parents, or your teachers, that failure was not an option. But you know what? Failure is not only an option. Failure is inevitable, according to the Bible and Winston Churchill. But when it comes, you must focus on what happens in you over what happens to you. Um, A couple Thursdays ago, local elementary school uh, was doing this thing called uh, Donuts with Dad. And uh, it was dads would come in a few minutes early, have some donuts with their kid, you know, before they went to work and the kid went to classes. And so some of the guys on our staff, we volunteered to go and to, you know, just have donuts with some kids who didn't have a dad. So on Thursday, I'm getting ready and I am like dreading this, like just so much. So much so that I seriously considered calling some of the other guys on staff and saying, I'm just not feeling well, man. I don't think I'm going to make it today. And I'd actually been sick a couple days earlier, so, you know, they would have believed me. Uh, But, you know, I'm the campus pastor, and I'm really not supposed to lie to the other pastors. We kind of frown on that. 
So, uh, you know, I got in the car, and I'm driving to the school, and I'm thinking, why? I, I was literally afraid. I'm saying, what, what am I afraid of? I mean, it's a second grader. Like, what's the worst that could happen, right? Some kind of donut dispute, and, you know, there's a big fight. I mean, I'm not in my peak physical condition, but I think I could take a second grader if I had to. <laughs> you know what I realized? You know what I was so afraid of? Of embarrassment. That I would get there and I would spend 15 minutes, you know, staring at a second grader that I couldn't get to talk to me, you know, eating a donut as slow as possible. And I got there and there was some kind of like communication glitch. And so they actually didn't have any kids in the, in the cafeteria that didn't have a dad. Um, and so I thought, well, you know, I'm, I usually can like carry in a conversation with an adult. I sit down um, with this guy's name was Jonathan and his second grade son's name was Sean. And I tried for 15 minutes. I could not get this kid to say one word to me. Like his dad's like, oh, he's shy. You know, but I'm telling you, I, I could not get, I couldn't get him to grunt in my direction. I couldn't get him to nod at me, like nothing. And so I'm driving away from the school and, and I'll be honest, I felt bad. I just felt bad. And so I started thinking to myself, like, how am I supposed to feel when something like this happens? Because we, like, we, we have a goal, like we try to meet it, and we don't. We fail. We don't. What we expected should happen did not happen. How are you supposed to feel? Well, allow yourself to feel disappointed, but not shame. It's okay to feel disappointed when things don't work out. But I didn't do anything to be ashamed of. See, when we talk about the fear of failure, what we're really talking about usually is the shame that's underneath it that we want to avoid. Because when we fail at something, we're ashamed of ourselves or others might be shame, might be shame, they might shame us. And this is crazy. But do you know the number one fear in America? Anybody know? Shout it out to me. The number one fear in America. Anybody know? Public speaking. public speaking. That's exactly right. Not you, though. You just spoke in public. Impressive. All right. But for the average person, you know, it is three above death in fear. Uh, Jerry Seinfeld, that uh, great theologian of our day, Observe, this means that if you go to a funeral, if you have to go to a funeral, the average person thinks they're better off in the casket than giving the eulogy. How crazy is that? The reason that we feel that way is underneath the failure is this feeling, unbelievably strong emotion that apparently we would rather die than experience. And that feeling is shame. So when you fail, allow yourself to feel disappointment, but not shame. Because you know, some of the time, <laughs> you're going to have a rough 15 minutes with a second grader that won't talk to you, but failure is an event. It is never a person. But what about the things, and I, I know you, some of you are thinking about this. What about the truly shameful things that we've done? What about those? We have to understand that although you are not a failure, the Bible says you are a sinner. We're all sinners. And to sin is to reject God's perfect law and to say, I don't care, or I don't believe you enough to do what you say. I'm just going to reject that and do what I want. That is shameful. And, and what do we do with that shame? Well, the psalmist said this in Psalm 25, to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be ashamed. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none of those who wait for you will be ashamed. Now, how could that be? How could the way to be lifted above our shame is to wait on the God who is a consuming fire of perfect righteousness and justice. How would I resolve my shame by going to him? Well, the Bible says that he loves us. He loves you so much that he became a man, Jesus. And you see, the punishment for your sin and my sin 
is death. And so he died on the cross. And not only did he die and take our punishment, but the Bible says that he took our shame when he took our punishment. And so we can be forgiven. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that right now. I'd like to ask everybody if you would bow your head and close your eyes, either here on campus or online. And if you would like to experience God's forgiveness, then I want you to pray this prayer just quietly in your own mind, if, if it is an expression of your desire. Just pray something like, God, I know I've broken your law, and I deserve to be punished, and I've done shameful things, but I believe you love me that you paid the penalty for my sin and rose from the dead. Please forgive me. Take away my shame. And as we just continue in prayer with your head bowed and your eyes closed, if you just prayed that prayer with me and you meant it, I want to ask you to do something. Would you just raise your hand? Just raise your hand up to God. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just raise your hand up to God to say, I want your forgiveness. I want to follow you. Man, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Online, you can just click the little icon with a hand. Thank you so much. Thank you. Go ahead and put your hands down. In fact, I'd like to ask everybody to look up at me. Listen, if you just prayed with me and you were sincere, God has taken away your sin. He's taken away your shame. But I need to tell you the whole truth. Even though those things are true, you will still fail. But you must also understand you can overcome. Would you jot that down? You can overcome. Do you know that God designed us in a way that when we face our fears of embarrassment and shame and failure, we can then overcome them? Jai Jang was born in China. And as a young child, he describes an experience he had in elementary school where he was publicly humiliated. And as he grew older, he realized that he was not able to move forward with his dreams or goals because he was paralyzed by the fear of shame and rejection and failure. And so here's what he decided to do. He decided for 100 days in a row, and this was after he had come to the States, that he would do something so absurd that he knew he would be rejected. And in doing that, he would learn to overcome failure and rejection. He actually filmed it. It's on YouTube still today. Uh, but let's take a minute and let's hear him explain it to us. Um, day one, <laughs> borrow $100 from, from stranger. So this is where I went to where I was working. I, uh, came downstairs and saw this big guy sitting behind a desk. You know, he, he looked like a security guard. So I just approached him and I was just going, I was just walking and that was the longest walk in my life. I just hair at the back of my neck standing up. I was sweating then my heart was pounding. And I got there and said, hey, um, sir, can I borrow $100 from you? <laughs> and he looked up, he's like, no, <laughs> why? And I just said, I said, no, I'm sorry. Then I turned around and just ran. <laughs> I felt, wow, this is like a microcosm of my life. Every time I feel the slightest rejection, I was just run as fast as I could. And you know what? The next day, no matter what happens, I'm not gonna run. I'll stay engaged. Day two, request a burger refill. <laughs> this is where I finished, uh, went to a burger joint, I finished lunch, and I went to the cashier and said, hey, can I get a burger refill? <laughs> and he was all confused. I was like, what's a burger refill? I said, well, just like a drink refill, but with a burger. <laughs> and he said, sorry, we don't do a burger refill, man. So he went on to do this 98 more days in a row. And he's now the founder and CEO of a corporation that trains companies like Google, their employees, how to overcome the fear of rejection and failure. Now, you don't have to manufacture situations that um, you have to overcome. You could just find something in your life right now that you're afraid to do, okay? That, that's not illegal or really, really stupid. And do it. And as you do, you will learn to overcome the fear of failure. What, what small thing are you embarrassed to do? Maybe to gently confront someone who tells a racist joke. 
Maybe um, if someone gossips about someone else in your presence, to ask them, hey, what did that person say uh, when you spoke to them about it? And then encourage them to, um, to go and speak to that person privately and speak to them instead of about them, like Jesus talked about. Um, I promise you, it will not always turn out the way you hope. But when you fall or maybe get pushed down, it says in Proverbs, a righteous man falls seven times and rises again. Ask God to encourage you, to help you uh, to have the right perspective. Do you know that you can see me right now because a guy named Thomas Edison had the right perspective? Like these lights, they exist because, do you know, he tried over 10,000 light bulb prototypes that didn't work, that failed. But he said, um, I've not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. See, to overcome the fear of failure, you must believe that you will fail, that you can overcome. And why don't you jot this down? You must take faith risks. That simply means that you must trust God enough to do what he says. In fact, it says it is impossible to please God without faith. You can't please him unless you are taking faith risks. You must trust him enough to do what he says, even when you're afraid that you might fail and that it won't work out the way you want it to. Let me kind of rewind back to when I got fired at that first church I ever worked at. Um, I decided to stay. I believed that I could learn more by staying and volunteering. And I began working at a uh, college called LaGuardia Community College in Queens for three and a half years. Eventually, they rehired me on staff, eventually asked me to be the senior pastor of the church, and I led the church for seven years. I, that led me to being involved in a ministry that, um, that trained other pastors, which led me to meeting Pastor Marty, knowing about North Star Church, which led me to be here today with you. And what if I hadn't? It was hard. It was really, really hard. I had failed. And it was just, it was, it was difficult. But I knew that without faith, it was impossible to please God. James says, without faith, work is what? Without faith, works are, they're dead. Without works, your faith, it's dead. It's meaningless. The New International Nike version that translated this way. Just do it. Like, if you don't just do it, you're never going to grow. You're never going to overcome. And so here's what I'm going to ask you guys to do. I'm going to offer you 12 faith risk challenges. They're there in the bottom of your notes. And I want you to go ahead and pull out your connection card, your notes and your connection cards. I want everybody to do this. In fact, if you are not a connection card filler outer, I'm going to challenge you to be one just today to take the risk to fill this out and let us know what you're planning to do for God to take a risk. So if you, if you need one of these, if you, we missed you, would you just raise your hand? Just hold your hand up, and we're going to bring you a program. Just keep it up until uh, we get you your program. And I realize 12 is a lot, and so you might be, uh, you know, uh, the mind might wander. So before we begin, you to take this challenge, uh, we're going to watch a Faith Without Works Is Dead, Just Do It video. Greatness, it's just something we made up. Somehow we've come to believe that greatness is a gift reserved for a chosen few, for prodigies, for superstars. And the rest of us can only stand by watching. You can forget that. Greatness is not some rare DNA strand. It's not some precious thing. Greatness is no more unique to us than breathing. We're all capable of it. 
All of us. I'm hoping that you will take one of these faith risk challenges and that you will put it on your connection card so that we can pray for you. So maybe if you prayed with me earlier to become a follower of Jesus, or maybe you've prayed in the past, but you've never let someone else know about your commitment. On, under my next step, first column, just check off, I'm becoming a follower of Jesus today. Or maybe you put your trust in him, but since you did that, you haven't been baptized. So maybe the step for you, because it's the first step after salvation, is you're ready to get baptized. Or maybe you've been away from God, and now you want to recommit your life to Christ. Then maybe you need to check that box that says, I'm recommitting my life to Christ. I want you to consider those uh, as we watch this next video. Greatness speaks for itself. Once it learns the tool. So maybe you're thinking, well, I'm just not mature enough. I haven't, I don't know enough yet. Well, under uh, sign me up for second column, maybe you need to check off step two. It's a class um, that we're giving 1215 today. We provide food and child care. Um, but man, like take that step because you're going to grow. Um, if you just can't today, then uh, do step three. Check it off and do it next week, step three. Um, or, you know, I, I don't know. Um, maybe it's a tithe challenge over here in this column or the devotional challenge to regularly spend time with Jesus. Or maybe you just need some help. You need to admit, like, I need help to get my finances together in a way that honors God. All right, why don't you consider those as we watch this next video? Some people are told they were born with greatness. Some people tell themselves. Maybe for you, the step is to be a part of one of our teams that serve. Uh, worship in production or guest services or kids. Um, and so you just need to write, you know, worship or production or guest services or kids and be a part of a team. You say, well, I don't feel qualified or I don't feel equipped. Well, you know what? God will make a way for you to serve, for you to be involved, for you to be more than a spectator. Or maybe you're just not ready for like an ongoing team. Um, the uh, Trunk or Treat is an outreach event that we're going to do the 29th of October. Three or four ways that you could be involved just one time serving just to kind of see how it is. So if you want to do that, um, put Trunk or Treat on the back. All right? As you think about these things, let's watch this video. Greatness is a scary thing until it isn't. Maybe the leap for you uh, is to finally be involved, try out a small group, a group of friends that will help you to grow in your faith. Just right, small group. Or maybe you're ready to lead a small group. You say, well, I, I can't do that. Well, you know what? If you're willing, we can prepare you and train you so you can do that with God's help. So maybe you need to write, lead a small group. But you need to do something or you've wasted your time or you're going backwards. Now, maybe those 11 things aren't your thing. And so I got a little spot there that says, insert dream here. And you know what you need to do. You know what your next step is. You need to write whatever that is in your connection card. Make a commitment. Take a step. I hope you will. Let's pray. Father, I pray you will help us to trust you enough to do what you say. In Jesus' name, amen. In just a moment, uh, we're going to receive our offering. And I hope before we do that you will take a step of faith, of risk, and put that on your connection card. Um, and I promise you, we will pray for you specifically this week. All right? So if you're on the right of your row, why don't you grab the bucket? Go ahead and pass it down. Be sure and put your connection card uh, in the bucket if you're online. Of course, you have a connection card there, and uh, you can give if you'd like just by clicking the blue give button at the top of your screen. And I kind of want to explain why we're doing what I mentioned, this trick, trunk or treat thing, because I know we do some stuff that's a little out there, right? So here, here's the deal. What happens is, is people bring their car, park it in the parking lot, 
and they decorate their trunk. It's from 3 to 5 on October 29th, Sunday, um, and basically kids in the community walk from trunk to trunk and trunk or, and treat. So that's the deal. The reason we do stuff like this is because people matter to God, and we will do anything short of sin to reach people. Last year, several people after the trunk or treat event came to the 5 p.m. service where they were able to hear and respond to the gospel. And that is ultimately why we do everything, so people can find the hope that is only in Jesus. You know, as we think about hope, um, this week many of you uh, were aware of what happened in Vegas. And so I, I want us to take a minute and I want us to pray together. Can we do that? Father, um, I pray for those who are touched by this tragedy. And Lord, I pray that, that you will help them through this to get closer to you and to better understand your love for them. Because you, you told us in your word that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor heights nor depth or any other created thing could ever keep us and separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And so we pray that even through this difficult time that you will draw them closer to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we stand together and sing as we consider the great love and power of God in our life. <laughs>